Well, if uh, I, I mean, if, if you find research otherwise, please let me know because uh, you know I, I can look at uh, I, I can look at upgrading or something along those lines. But I appreciate the heads up on that, Thantos. All right. Well, what we're gonna do? Why don't we go into our workshop, everyone? Let's go into our workshop and there we go. What we had done last night was created a setting and we did so using our settlement worksheet and some random roles from all of you out there in chat. We came up with a, a, a brief backstory for the statue that was important to these people. KH Darkwolf gave us a water feature that looks like pants. And in the process, we ended up making a pun because we had a series of bridges uh, that ended up being locks. Uh, and we were saying, oh, this kind of looks like Psylocke. And, uh, and so the, apparently the three bridges or the three locks uh, are labeled PSY. So we have the Psylocke's. Uh, that are here. Uh, I, I yeah, I, I forget the name uh, Thantos of what it is. And I appreciate the heads up on that too, Thantos. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna follow another worksheet. And it won't even take all that long. I mean, we're, we're talking about ecology and geology, and a lot of this is just going to be a, an open-ended discussion about how we want to have things arranged. And, of course, nothing up here has to be fixed in how we ended up sketching it out on our, on our map. And the worksheet that I want to go through with you all is this ecology and geology notes. Remember, this is the concept stage for us as dungeon masters. This is us kicking around ideas. We're setting the foundation because we know we want to run an adventure that's different than just Lord of the Rings or it's different from an anime that we watch. You know, we want it to be our own sort of cool, unique twist on things. And so here's a new worksheet that we haven't used, not officially before, that has some ideas on how we can randomly generate elements of our ecology. And when we talk about ecology, you know, we're, we're talking about how does the wilderness function? Uh, what are the predators? What are the prey? Is there something interesting in the, you know, in the environment in some other capacity? We're going to get some prompts, and those prompts will lead us to a discussion on how it might work or interact. And so this is a bit of a, uh, I guess, a, a, a prototype for us to run through with this. Yes, this is a continuation from the other night. Uh, and now we're going to add another layer of discussion. That's going to be the ecology, the ecosystems. Uh, you know, we'll discuss what lives here um, and how things, well, flow. <laughs> in a sense. So yeah, Trevor, this is a map we made in paint of the setting that we randomly generated last night. Hi, but witchcraft, welcome, welcome. We get some Bewitch love, and so, Bewitch, you're going to get some love right back. Thank you very much. And Trevor, if you weren't here last night, that's absolutely fine. You can still partake in what we have going on. In fact, I'll even say this. Uh, Trevor, as we're going through the ecology and geology notes here, uh, we ended up with two different major terrain types. Oh, that was our NPC. Forest and grassland.
And you know what kind what what is the predominant forest that's here? And what about the grassland? What type of grassland do we want this to be? Though when it comes to the mechanics of D&D, remember rangers and druids have mechanics that are tied to one of eight different biomes. Uh, if we go to, was it 30 something? No, oh, a little bit more. Went too far. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. And where do those eight come from? Well, here's one reference. The circle, uh, the circle spells for druids or the favored terrains of rangers. There are these eight. Hey, Black Kevin. Good evening to you. So the first, the first aspect that we're going to roll for here. You know, this is known for varietal. Oh, not yet. Uh, not yet, Trevor. Uh, we don't need to make that determination. I mean, if it comes to us, sure, we can put some ideas down. Uh, but we don't need to know that just yet. Uh, right. Uh, for for now, we're going to do some uh, some placeholders. Um, uh, hang on one second. I, I got to get something here. Hi, hello everyone. Sorry about that. It's a uh, it's a dark and foggy night here, and uh, there was a not a not necessarily a bang like a gunshot or something. I don't know if someone dropped something or whatever, but there was just a loud noise, and there was uh, someone standing by the tree out front. 
and uh, just needed to go and check and make sure that everything was okay. A uh, person wasn't there anymore, so... I mean, it's, it's like a super creepy Silent Hill fog that's going around right now. Ooh, pardon me. Uh, but hi, I'm here, I'm alive, I'm well, so are you, all of you, hopefully. Um, yeah, yeah, Diadems kinda, kinda is. Uh, but it's cases like that, why, uh, why if uh, any of you can carry around some personal protection, uh, you know, that comes in a lot of different forms, uh, if necessary, I have, uh, I have a nine millimeter, uh, form of personal security that hopefully it never comes to me having to use it, but, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't live, I, I'm not in a super uppity, you know, uppity muckety neighborhood. I'm also not in a super, like, run-down neighborhood either. Uh, but, I don't know, you just hear something, and you go and check it out, and there's someone outside, kind of by your tree. Which, you know, the sidewalk goes past the tree, so, you know, they could have just stopped. Maybe it was someone who was walking by, and also heard, I don't know, something fall, or whatever, whatever happened. You know, but whatever. It is what it is. And hello, hello. But you know what? You gotta... Gotta do what you gotta do. So, sorry for the wait, everyone. Hi, we're talking about Dungeons & Dragons. And also, hello, Pain Guy. Welcome. So, we, we got our forest and our grassland gened up, and now... Uh, and now I figure a fun way to help determine, in a random fashion, what kind of creatures live or, uh, live around and about. Well, why don't we, you know, if we went to the druids and arguably the rangers as well. Though, why don't we also, why don't we also focus on the rangers as rangers are products of the lands which they've lived on and from and uh, and grew up around. And rangers... Rangers get something called a favored enemy. And there are different types of favored enemies that one can take. And if we come over here and we go down to ranger... Because rangers, rangers are not a bad class in D&D. You know, especially if you talk with your dungeon master, rangers can be super awesome and really, really good. Are they universalist good? No. I mean, a barbarian can swing and hit whatever's in front of that barbarian. Rangers, though. Rangers, you know, don't even have to feel always limited. And of course, look, if you play a ranger, and you're like, yeah, I'm a ranger of the forest and the swamp. And then your DM says, all right, we're playing a desert campaign. There was a communication breakdown somewhere. And it does not hurt nor detract to take away from having a conversation with your DM about the terrain you're going to be exploring and moving through and moving into, you know, what might happen in the future. And so that's why as a dungeon master, if we take druids and rangers into consideration when we want to present, when we want to present to our players, here's where we're going to be playing, then our players might say, you know what? I could make a ranger that can take advantage of these features. And absolutely you can. And have a blast with it as well. Hi, Shadamura. Welcome, welcome. That's right, T. Casimir. Casimir the Hunter. Josh says heavily underplayed class on my side. I'd like to see it. I'd like to see how to make it appear more useful to players. And if we base our if we base our campaign with the consideration of druids and rangers, Josh, then we'll have that we'll have that open. And if we think that we're going to go off the map in some way, we know we know where the center of our world starts. And we can imagine that off at the origin of the water is going to be mountains. 
and so we can talk about mountainous terrain for a ranger to move into. That the water will flow down to the sea, and so a coastal ranger would be a place to go. And if we want to say that the, that this river ends up flowing through a desert, but because we have a base of knowledge, we can then have these conversations with our players, and that would empower a player to feel really comfortable to feel really comfortable in uh in um playing a ranger. Sorry, I had a brain fart. Yeah, if if you want city centered ones, um you know, or you do something uh you, you do something uh custom or homebrew with it. Sorry, one second here. Okay. And I will say this as well. A good conversation to have with your ranger players would also be, you know, it doesn't have to be every encounter. But I'll tell you, if a ranger, if a ranger as a hunter... You know, Colossus Slayer is is cool. You know, that's kind of their singular. It's a universal. Um, but a giant killer or a horde breaker? Oh my gosh, you can do a whole lot. And so if you are going giant hunting, or maybe it's thematic for your campaign, if there's just more monolithic, you know, single creatures or or just a bunch of creatures that are bigger that live in the area and you have a ranger that wants to play a hunter. Colossus Slayer isn't bad, but my goodness, Giant Killer and Horde Breaker can... You, you can have some, like, top DPR in those special circumstances, but again, those are things to talk about with your Dungeon Master. Hi, Infernizard. So we have our different, we have our, our favored. Oh, that's rogue. I need ranger. All right. There are 14 different types. There are 14 different types of creature categories. So why don't we why don't we roll over here if we want to do some some random you know so the forest is going to be known for a variety of what you know does it end up being birds maybe there's varietal oozes you know it's just an oozy forest not necessarily good or bad that many of them could be very peaceful oozes then what about prey type you know, would this be a grassland full of birds or deer as we would know prey types to be? Maybe prey types could be bugs or something else. Also, we're going to roll for a common predator type. As well, why don't we have some fun and build a story? This forest is home to a notorious what? Then we're going to add a wilderness feature of some variety... Uh, as uh, the general appearance, it generally appears in some fashion. You know, how would you describe the trees that grow in this forest? And then it inspires ideals of what? If someone looked at this forest and said, ah, you know, this forest is giving me this kind of a vibe. We're going to roll for that as well. Uh, so, uh, Raz, do you want to change your, uh, do you want to change your reserved role for any of these? Dark Wolf wanted to roll, I guess, on the Forest Predator, but Raz, would you like to change, uh, your role to a guaranteed something else?
roll first or second category. All right. Reezy wants to roll for the forest vibe. All right, we can do that. Then, Raz, you can kick us off here. Uh, we'll use your roll uh, for the category here. And let's see, if we have 14 choices, uh, how can we get this on... All right. Uh... Yeah, Trevor, you can do so. There's not a 14-sided roll, Raz. Uh, so what we'll do, Raz, roll a... Uh, roll a... D4. And if it's a 1 or a 2, it'll be... Uh, it'll be the, uh, the first set... Of seven. If it's a three and four, it'll be the second set of seven. I, I'll have to, with Mathrox bot kind of being down, I'll have to rethink my my backup dice roll bot. All right. So now I want you to roll one d eight, and if it's an eight, we'll. I guess we could just re-roll here. Rolls a seven. All right. So, it's known for varietal fey. So, you know, different fey creatures. It could be blink dogs or fey spiders. It could be, I don't know, there's some pixies that jam out in the forest. Uh, now, we need, a, what is a common prey type? What's an animal uh, category that would be more of the, you know, lower on the food chain? The the grazers, so to speak. Uh, let's have uh, Shatamura. Will you please type exclamation point 1D4? Oh, yeah. It, underground tunnels, maybe Displacer Beast's room. Uh, we might have lost Shatamura Thantos. Will you please type exclamation point 1D4? Oh, there we go. All right, Thantos, I need you to type exclamation point 1D8, please. So we roll a three, so we're going to go for the second set of seven. We have to be creative with this, with the, the dice commands that I have. Lands on a three. So, one, two, monstrosities. Interesting. So, the common prey type are monstrosities. And now, what preys upon the monstrosities? What preys upon the monstrosities? Well, they might not even have to be uh, tiny monstrosities. Uh, they could be really big, but they could just be uh, docile or uh, herbivorous or something. And so the common predator type... Uh, the common predator type is a role that was reserved by Dark Wolf. And so, Dark Wolf, will you please roll a d4 and then a d8? All right, first set of seven. And number three. Celestials. Celestials. 
So there are predatory celestials. Um, you know, you uh, carnivorous unicorns. Uh, that are that are eating the monstrosities, and and overall, as either prey or even like a subset of predators, could also be the fae, because there's varietal fae, and we also just make up our own or relabel something if we want. Now. This forest is home to a notorious something. A notorious something. And if I could get some help ro uh, rolling Infernizard. Infernizard, will you please type exclamation point 1D4? And the other Josh Art, will you please type exclamation point 1D8? Could be parasites. Yeah, there you go, West River Rat. All right, Infer uh, Infernizard, are you still with us? Uh, if not, uh, let's see. Who... Uh, Exhausted Dragon, are you still with us? Exhausted Dragon, will you please type exclamation point 1D4? Rolls on a 1. So there's a notorious Fey. So think of this like, I don't know, it's a local legend or a notorious monster uh, that such as we find in maybe some MMORPGs. So this could be, uh, you know, there's some kind of a notorious fae, like a hag, uh, that lives in the woods. You know, so this would be a creature of folklore, legend, myth, etc., Yeah, maybe a dryad even. Uh, you know, we have a placeholder, and we'll, we can go through and detail it as we need to. Now, Trevor the Dwarf, you wanted to roll for the forest uh, feature, for the wilderness feature that we find. And what I want to do then, there are different wilderness features. There are monster lairs, monuments, ruins. Uh, uh, there, I mean, we have a settlement. But, uh, strongholds? Many fall in the face of chaos, but not this one. Not today. Or a weird locale. Uh, so, what I would like you to do, and maybe what we can even do, um, you know, if we have settlement, we already have our city, but this could be, I don't know, a little, a little camp of some kind, or a commune, or something along those lines. And so what I'd like you to do, Trevor the Dwarf, will you please type exclamation point 1D6 to let us know a, like a custom in these woods is some, uh, is some feature. Stops on a one. There is a monster lair. Now, maybe the monster lair is home to this n n uh, notorious fey. Possibly. Also, DC, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that 250 and the upgrade for your painted figure. And so we can decide what kind of a monster lair we want to exist in the woods. All right, now how how do the woods generally appear? And we're gonna go to the NPC stat block for this. I went too far. We're going to use these, uh, these terms that we would apply to people, and we're going to apply it to the forest and see if that uh, provides some kind of inspiration. And so, uh, DC, can I please have a D20 roll in chat? Exclamation point, 1D20. Stop. 
stops on a six. There is a pronounced scar as a as, as uh, something appears in the woods. Now, how do we want to interpret that for the forest? Is there a scar through the forest? And if so, why why do trees not grow there? What happened? Were they cut down? Did were they blighted? Or do we want this to be every tree seems to bear a scar of some kind? Maybe it's a marking. Uh, what could be causing it? How do we want to interpret the pronounced scar that we find in the forest of our of our uh, settlement or of our setting? Could be a magical battle area. And thank you, uh, Monkey King seventy five, for the follow. Yeah, DC. Yep, yep. I know what those are going towards. And we can always go back. We have a working, we have a, a working example of our map. And this could be something that if we want to add to it, if we say there's a scar going through the woods or there's a scar on all the trees and what caused it, is it territorial markings? Is it something that these trees are known for? Could it be related to the sealed pyramid? You know, was it a magical battle area? Um, you know, is the scar related to this uh, trail that actually, this road? We can find inspiration and we can, uh, we can even add to it here. So if there's some kind of a scar or an open area, um, hmm. We can have the, the location of the pyramid perhaps be a part of it too and uh, and follow along some kind of, um, maybe some kind of pattern or almost like a, a, a scar might, might end up being something like a crop circle or the like. Or if it was a magical battle area because a lot of dead are buried here uh, and this was part of an old civilization like what we were talking about and to go into Raz's idea, uh, something might have happened then what if the, our pyramid was built at the end of, you know, some sort of a vast field that opens up and that no trees grow here because it was a place of such uh, magical death and chaos that nothing can grow here and a pyramid was put. Oh, DC, thank you very much. And maybe that's why this pyramid is a part of the anti-magic field that has gone up because it will prevent another huge uh, battle that would scar the land. And you see, just as easy as that, we're creating history and some supernatural cool stuff in the background. And we're using that to buttress, heh, we're using that to buttress our other points that we developed. Well, thank you also, Thantos. What is that going towards? Now, there uh what is the forest vibe? It is inspiring it is inspiring something. And this role was locked in by Reezy. And so Reezy, we're going to manifest this. Uh, we're going to manifest this uh, roll uh, type exclamation point four D six. And we're going to use the first two numbers of that to find out what the ideal of our forest is. Hi, McGruber. Good to see you. PC parts. All right. You just got uh, an 18 kill, 5,000 damage in Warzone. 
I I I am not familiar with Warzone, so I'm I'm presuming that's like you were uh, you're an ace shooter there. All right, Reezy is gonna give us five and three. We're gonna come back here. And what is the ideal of 5-3? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We have a neutral ideal. Neutral ideal of 3 is live. Live and let live. So kind of like a, a oneness. Kind of a, you know what? A bird gets eaten by a cat. That's nature. Uh, let the let the bird survive. Let the cat survive. Let us do what we're going to do. And, you know, life will go on. And we just got to be cool about it. Yes. Uh, your sneak attack dice also go up on a, on a, a crit. You roll, you roll twice the dice. It doesn't... It, it doubles the damage dice, not the damage rolled. So, yeah, a 10 doesn't go to a 20. If you got a 10 on 3d6, you might get a 6 on 6d6, but your dice double. All right, so the, the whole forest kind of puts off this. Just let things happen, man. We don't have to like it, but it's all it's all what needs to happen. Yeah, I mean, your DM might say, I don't care, double the damage to save on dice rolls. Um, you know, talk about it, yeah. Now, what about our grasslands area? You know, this is our farmland, our cemetery, it's where our city newly expanded into. There's a lot of open grassland, farming land. It could even be kind of almost like Dust Bowl or Great Plains here in the U.S. Or some kind of like a taiga or a steppe. Uh, out towards uh, Russia and Mongolia. Grasslands don't have to be verdant pastures of eternally green grass as far as the eye can see. It can be a lot more rustic and rugged. You know, maybe not like a wasteland per se, but there certainly could be a lot of scrub brush if we want it to be. Uh, but it's grassland enough that it counts as grassland, it cr counts as prairies. Whatever kind of a grassland you want this to be, we can make it as such. So now let's start populating the ecology of our of our grasslands. Yeah, it's just the dice that double on a crit. Uh, now, so this, uh, our pastures, our grassland is known for varietal what's. Uh, DC, will you please type exclamation point 1D4? Josh, will you please type exclamation point 1D8? Oh, yeah, there, there probably is West River Rat. We haven't gotten into, like, urban mapping. Oh, DC, are you there? We might have lost DC. West River Act, can you please type exclamation point 1D4? Stops on a 2. Alright, so there are varietal fiends. 
varietal fiends that populate the grasslands. So, I don't know. I mean, you got chipmunks, squirrels, imps, quasits, you know, varietal fiends. Now, the common prey type out in the grasslands uh, is, um, is what? So, let's have, uh, Raz, will you please roll a d4? Oh, I asked Raz right as Raz has to go AFK. Uh, McGruber, can you please type exclamation point 1D8? And can I have Exhausted Dragon type exclamation point 1D4? If there are others of you out there watching that you would like to roll, please let me know, okay? All right, Exhausted Dragon is going to load in our 4 through 14. I mean, 8 through 14. All right, MacGruber might not be here. Uh, Thantos, will you give me a D8 roll, please? Uh, Predator has already been claimed by Dark Wolf, Reezy, if you want to change it. Um, oh, so we're, we have fiends again. So not only are there varietal fiends, but the fiends are actually a common prey type. And so Dark Wolf ended up locking in the Predator. So Reezy, if you want something else, you can swap to it. Dark Wolf, will you give me a D4 roll and then a D8 roll? Okay, DC, thanks for stopping by. And thank you for uh, thank you for your contribution too. I appreciate it. Dark Wolf is uh if you roll a 1, okay. So what what preys on the fiends? Uh, undead. Uh, hey, oh jeez, it writes itself. Everyone, where were we saying that a lot of the uh, a lot of the people were buried? Bada boom in the grasslands. So it would seem that the undead that are coming back are a common predator type. Notorious. All right, Reezy. Uh, 1d4 and 1d8 to give us our notorious monster. Look, if y'all just believe, it writes itself, and we can find ways to connect this. All right, so we're on the Fiends through Undead, and now on the D8 roll, we have a Notorious... We have a Notorious Fiend. So maybe one of them turned into a dire, uh, uh, you know, a dire deer that hunts the wolves instead, or a dire sheep, as it were. All right, now we need a wilderness feature of some kind. And uh, can I have... Uh, who would... Let's see, who can we have roll? Kevin, are you here? Bewitchcraft, are you here? Who else is hanging out that would like to get in on this? Oh, hi, there you are. All right, Kevin, you're here. Kevin, can you please type exclamation point 1D6? You have a sticker on your tail? 
We have cat butt. It's official. Stops on a one. Another monster lair. Okay. So it could be a, a nest of fiends. That could be where our notorious monster lives. Um, or, you know, if we say, well, the fiends are prominent. Fiends are prominent out here. What if it's actually a monster lair for a uh, owlbears? And it's just a unique little, like, ecosystem within the grasslands where owlbears live. All right. Now, how does this generally appear? How does it generally appear? And uh, can I have... Uh, Josh, will you please give me a D20 roll? If we were to, uh, personify the grasslands, we could say that it has what? Other than fiends. Stops on a nine. Unusual eye color. Unusual eye color. So, it generally appears unusual eye color. So, this means that maybe our grasses are different here. Maybe our grasses are purple and orange instead of, I don't know, like greens and reds. But our grasslands have unusual colors, and maybe that's because of the magic or the fiends or something else. Come about when we're describing this to our players... We can confidently say, when you step out into the plains beyond the city, into the farmlands, the grasses that grow here are, bada boom, or cotton candy pink. It could be tied to the pyramid in some way, Thantos. Could be purple grass, but witchcraft. All right, but witchcraft. Uh, will you please type exclamation point four d six? And the first two numbers we're going to use to indicate uh, what what does uh, what do these grasslands inspire in people? In you inspire two and five, evil and retribution. Oh wait, uh, yeah, wait, yeah, that, that was the ideal. So this other one was uh, a neutral live and let live. All right. So the grasslands have this kind of uh, maybe a battlefield of judgment or something else going on where it, when people think of the open grasslands beyond the city, maybe even outside this protective anti-magic bubble, uh, they have this reputation for... You know, kind of sinister things happen out there. Yeah, and so maybe people have to go out and harvest these special grasses because they're actually imbued with magic. It's just risky going and getting them, kind of like pearl diving. You want pretty pearls? You're going to have to pay someone to risk their life to dive down for them. All right, now... Somewhere out there, let's let's install a dungeon. Let's install a dungeon of some kind. I don't know where. Uh, it could be in the city. I, I don't know where it'll be. And what's nice is there is a whole system in the Dungeon Master's Guide to walk you through inspiration on dungeon making. Do let me get to it real quick. All right, building a dungeon. Welcome back, Raz. Uh, West River Rat, I need you to tell us what is the inspiration for our dungeon location. 
and I need you to do that by typing exclamation point 1D20. Or I'm sorry, not 1D20, not 1D20. West Riverette, please type exclamation point 1D100 in chat. Also, I'm going to make a computer noise as I plug in my headphones to charge. Stops on a 77. Uh, several connected mesas. All right, now, we don't have, on our map, we don't necessarily have mesas. How can we, uh, given the information we have, but sticking to the uh, spirit of the prompt, the closest thing that we might actually have to a mesa could be this system of locks, the P, S, and Y locks, or the Psy locks, in a sense. And this could actually end up being maybe a kind of a watery dungeon, right? These were already canals. What if the canals have underground structures like sewers that turn into a dungeon? It writes itself, everyone. You all saw it was here before this happened. Let's go with the prompt, and it absolutely works. Oh, Phantos. Well, I'm glad that you're. I'm glad that you're digging it. I'm sorry to distract you from it. Uh, what do you want to put the three towards, Phantos? Now, do you all think it would would a system of canal locks be like mesas, right? A mesa is a raised area, like a flat mountain that rises up out of the ground. That could be, we could interpret that as a mesa since a lock is a body of water that rises up out of a ground. Tamiya's thanks. Well, thank you very much. Uh, in that case, I'll put it to the computer part since that's kind of going to me since it's less that has to come out of pocket. And so thank you very much for that. So here, uh, this is a series, uh, series of connected locks. Now, who created, who created our dungeon? Uh, but witchcraft, uh, as you're uh, as you're fresh to being back here, I want you to tell me who created our dungeon, and you can do so by typing exclamation point one d twenty. We might have lost Bewitchcraft. Uh, Thantos, if I already have you distracted, can you please type exclamation point 1D20? Stops on a 2. A cult or a religious group. And it has its own subtable as well. Alright, Raz. Raz, will you please type 1D20 in chat to let us know what kind of a cult created our dungeon? Are you serious? All right, I want everyone to realize... Who created a dungeon that was a series of connected water locks? What do we say? What do we say around here, everyone? What do what's our phrase? Why should you never go, oh, I can't think of anything? Or oh, I, I you know, I'm nervous about rolling randomly. 
Hello. It writes itself. This was meant to happen, everyone. This was meant to happen. Now, what was the purpose of our dungeon? Ravenstar. Ravenstar, will you please type exclamation point 1D20 in chat? Stops on a 15. It was created as a temple or a shrine. We have a water temple, everyone. Uh, we're going to play some 3 d d with puzzles. The locks were meant to worship water and to elevate and to facilitate. Now, what happened? What is the history of our dungeon? And by the way, if we're talking about maybe merfolk had lived here pre like a long time ago, like primordial merfolk that went off to the coast and became like eventually evolved into Vidalkin that came back. This works out even, even better. Even it all, everything is falling into place for us. Uh, Reezy, what happened to our dungeon? Please type exclamation point 1D20. Stops on a nine. Creators were destroyed by attacking raiders. What could the raiders have been? Could they have been some of these fiends or something else? Could they have been, I don't know, uh, another, another civilization or race that we've never encountered yet? Could it be that this is this is what drove off the merfolk were the Aarakocra? And the Aarakocra moved and settled in and ended up taking over, but they're not really aquatic birds, so the locks were just sort of left to do what they were meant to do. How can we tie this into the history we've created and everything still makes sense? The Aarakocra could have been the ones to migrate in, drove off the merfolk, the merfolk changed into Vidalkin and came back, ironically, to take refuge with the Aarakocra, who probably don't even remember that they're the ones who drove the merfolk out. Now, there's some kind of a common encounter. You know, it, it, you know, we can always go for uh, some kind of, uh, you know, puzzles or whatever, but let's say that there are monsters in here. There's some kind of a common monster that lives in these locks. And so can I have... Uh, uh, let's see, who hasn't rolled in a while? Do, 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 do. Uh, Kevin. Kevin, can you please type exclamation point 1D4? Okay, and now can I have, uh, let's have, do, 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 Exhausted Dragon, can you please type exclamation point 1D8? Lands on a one. Fiends. Ah, so there's also, there's a lot of fiends in here too. All right, so there's common encounters that are fiends. Can we link the fiends then to the fiends that live in the grasslands, right? If we're talking about the locks, the grasslands, you know, the fiends might also be aquatic. 
maybe we find a different kind of fiend that live in here or that were sealed away. You know, this is some kind of, uh, and by the way, if you wanted to manually choose elementals because it's an elemental cult, that's absolutely fine. If we want to say fiends have taken over or something along those lines, we can absolutely, we're using them as prompts and that's the beauty of this process. Now, there's a notorious monster of some kind that lives in this dungeon. And maybe it's like the big lunker that lives in the in the river. Dark Wolf, will you please roll for the notorious monster? I need a D4 and a D8 from you, please. What lives in our pants, Dark Wolf? We have uh, the high numbers and then a six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Two humanoid races. Ooh. Lost tribes sealed away, right? If Aarakocra and Vidalkin live here, let alone if we wanted, like, you know, the player's handbook is like, eh, here's four basic fantasy races and maybe you want to include tieflings and gnomes and dragonborn too. As a dungeon master, we can say these are the, the select few races that live here. So now, if we're saying that there are two humanoid races, who, you know, who, who are the, uh, who are the murlocs that are living in the sewers? Or I'm sorry, the morlocks. You know, from X-Men, if you're familiar, who are the morlocks that live in our sewers? Dark Wolf, you want to roll for one of them? Hey, Popo Potatoes in Neo Realms. Hello. All right. So, Dark Wolf, I want you to type exclamation point. Uh, let's see. We have 50. Uh, so that would be, if we break it, okay, I want you to type exclamation point 1d6. Three. And now I want you to type exclamation point. Uh, I want you to type exclamation point uh, 1d10. So this is 1, 2, 3. And then... Oh, that's right. We could have done... Our, uh, that's what we did last time was the rollover. I'm sorry, Dark Wolf. I was overcomplicating it. Well, this will still work. And it lands on a 9. 1... Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So apparently we have very pale, uh, we have pale humans that live in the sewers. <laughs> uh, so we have sort of this sealed away forgotten race of core. And if you don't want to use all of the race options, you want to modify it. And here we could turn things on and off. But if we leave all options open... There is a pale, it almost looking like a sightless uh, ver a variety of humanoid known as the core. Home to a notorious core and something else tribes. All right, Raz, we're going to do this easy and have a rollover 1D100. Raz, type in exclamation point 1D100, please. Yeah, if any of you played Magic and you've seen the core, it's those. Stops on a 43, and so a 43 is going to be... Oh, and Tortles! What? How dare Tortles live around water? That is ridiculous and unbelievable. Now, 
this dungeon will also hide a secret. Neo Realms. I like titles. <laughs> Neo Realms. I need you. Uh, I need you to uh, help me understand the secret that our dungeon hides. And uh, in so doing, actually, I got to go up this way. Boop, 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 boop. We're going to give it sort of a flaw and a secret that's personified in the NPC creation chart. Neo Realms, will you please type exclamation point 1D12? Oh, in the case Neo Realms isn't here, Popo Potatoes, will you please type exclamation point 1D12? Sound of feasting home. Rad Mad Mal, thank you very much for the follow. Welcome aboard. Seven, a powerful enemy. A powerful enemy is uh, either, uh, and how do we want to take this? Do the locks themselves have an enemy? Are the locks perhaps as a shrine? Are they holding back a powerful enemy? Is it sealing something inside? At the end of this dungeon, you know, there's a secret, and the secret was the whole time that this uh, that this temple, the series of locks, has a powerful enemy. So what do we want to do with that? And now we have an ecology. Look, we come up here. You know, we say, so the forest is known for varietal fae. You might say that the fae are simply uh, a certain species of butterfly, and maybe you want them to uh, have stats similar to pixies, but not be intelligent. It's fine to swap things around. Do you want an owlbear to be an aberration or a celestial instead of a monstrosity? Reskin your monsters like that. We have the prompts. Ask yourself now, how does this work? How does one thing feed on another thing? What what do our what do our celestials look like? We have celestials that prey on monstrosities. Oh, Thantos, that's very kind of you. Thank you for gifting that sub to Rad. Yes, Rytel. Yes, it is. You know when we say that uh, uh, that uh, the varietal fiends are found out here. You know, not every fiend has to be, uh, every fiend doesn't have to be a pit fiend. Or, oh, Thantos, that is so generous of you. We have prey monstrosities, we can make owl goats. Dark Wolf is tying everything together. So yeah, maybe our monstrosities are owl goats, you know, that live out here. Uh, or that live in the in the woods, and maybe the fiends that live out here that are preyed upon are abyssal chickens, except they're like quails. I don't know. They're abyssal quails and abyssal, uh, um, I don't know, some ducks, abyssal ducks that live along the water. Thantos, that is so kind of you. I hope you all enjoy your emotes. You have a lot of cool emotes that uh, you have access to, and all of these subscriptions 
are going to add up when we have our June miniature, uh, miniature box raffle on the 17th. The 17th of June will be the minis raffle for that month, and the number of subscribers to the channel determine how many boxes I give out that night. So sure, so what we can do here, now that we have an outline, what about crying ducks named tear ducks? <laughs> sure, let's come up with all, with all kinds of stuff. Now that we can make, we have an outline, we have our prompts. So if we have a common prey type of monstrosities, um, we have um, owl goats. Uh, we have tear ducks. Although maybe they also tear into people as well, but we have uh, tear ducks, tear ducks. And we can go through and we can add all kinds of things. Like, what is the notorious fae that lives here? Do we want to generate it like a villain? Like an NPC? Do we just want to go to a kobold fight club and look up fey monsters and randomly choose one. There's all kinds of things that we can do. We can now map out the dungeon. We can now maybe even map out uh, our two monster layers since uh, each of these areas features a monster layer of some kind. Oh, that's right. They were, they were hooten, hooten nannies. Hootin' nannies. Nanny goats. Hootin' nannies. So now we can have fun as DMs, and we can we can research into Volos, uh, Morton Canaan's, the Monster Menagerie. We can open up, I don't know, is there a cool monster in Tomb of Annihilation you think would fit this really well? Or if you want to look for fiends... Open up, uh, open up, uh, descent into Avernus. I don't know. Maybe there's a bunch of little, uh, a bunch of little dretches, you know, just sort of like low tier stuff. And, and just because dretches in the monster manual or wherever else might attack people as a, as a fiend, there's nothing saying we can't treat our fiends as wild animals, as rabbits, um, as, uh, hawks. You know, uh, maybe we have some uh, imps that act like uh, that act like kestrels or something. You know, it's still a natural world. It's just that these monsters carry not the beast type, but the fiend type. They can be intelligent, or maybe at one time they were intelligent, but something happened. Something broke the command, and so they just sort of reverted to a natural state. You know, just like we have more locks in the tunnels. You know, these core, the, these core and tortles, these quartles, K-O-R-T-L-E-S. And in fact, if you didn't want two different humanoid, humanoid tribes living in there, if we're saying that merfolk were the ones that lived here, maybe we pineapple pen the two races together into a horrible, beautiful homunculus, and we just invented a new race called the quartles. Pale, you know, uh, it's like... Pale turtle folk who like to climb. So maybe they have claws. And so can you imagine? All right, you're a DM and you send your players into the into the, the lock dungeon here. Can you imagine setting something up where you're describing and by the way, like cave fishers and all this other other stuff would be cool in here too? But you describe an encounter with humanoids? It's almost like aliens, right? You get these, like, pale, clawed turtle people, these cordals, crawling along the walls and ceilings because they can. You want to talk about an original adventure setting? Are you going to find this in a, in a Tolkien book? Are you going to find this in a Magic the Gathering novel? Are you going to find this in, I don't know, uh, Game of Thrones or the Song of Ice and Fire? We just invented an ancient uh, water cult lock system from people that sort of mutated into these cordals after the original merfolk were driven off by 
uh, were dri driven off by Aarakocra, they went out to the sea or somewhere else, became, uh, went from being merfolk and like fully amphibious to partially amphibious and came back because of a plague. All of this wrote itself. We didn't have to spin our wheels and go, oh, agony. I have writer's block because the inspiration, it just keeps coming and it just keeps coming and it just keeps coming and it just keeps coming. And it just keeps coming and it just keeps coming and it just keeps coming and it just keeps coming. Look how easy this is. It's coming together. And now you, you can describe a purple, a, a field of purple grass and flapping overhead, you know, there's some hunters and they draw their bows as you hear a pff, 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 and you just see a flock of, uh, of abyssal chickens, abyssal prayer, uh, prairie chickens flying overhead. And if you have players, if you have players that want to be a ranger, look at what you've provided. Your ranger might argue, can I get coast for if I hunt along the water? Eh, sure, why not? We have grasslands, we have forests. We arguably could have someone who's used to going through the underground tunnels might even know about the dungeon, but never has breached into like the super sealed off dungeon part. So we can have, uh, as we describe this place and we have, we're, we're picking up interest. People might say, oh yeah, I want to play a ranger. What, what's available? Here's four biomes that you can choose. I want to play a druid, a circle of land druid. Here's four biomes that you can use. What races are available? I'm glad that you asked. Ba -ba -do -ba -do -ba -do. And by the way, if you want to play a tiefling, because maybe you had an Aarakocra, maybe you had an Aarakocra that ended up uh, getting caught up in some infernal magic. You can say tieflings are available to play, but you have to take the winged tiefling variant. And and uh, you are at, and you have Aarakocran features, but a fiendish influence. And so we're running the flying tieflings as tieflings. But in the lore of the world, they're actually Aarakocra that had a magical influence of some kind. Oh, all right. We have the Vidalcan. You might also say that for some reason the Vidalcan, if there's a mutagenic property, if we're saying that magic has done weird things outside the, uh, the magic uh, area... Maybe it's even, maybe you could even describe for those that fled, uh, that fled from the plague. Maybe, uh, you know how, uh, in Star Trek lore, they explained, uh, how Klingons lost their forehead ridges and then gained forehead ridges later on. Cause it was like a genetic virus. What if you say you could play Videlkin, but if you're looking at uh, other semi-aquatic races, you might even say that the Videlkin, you can you can choose to play a Simic hybrid. So now we have a couple core races that all make sense to the events of the world that you're presenting. The Aarakocra, maybe they came down from the mountains far off to the east. So we have Aarakocra and we have Tieflings that are the flying Tiefling uh, variant. And you might even say, you know what, if I'm going to allow plane shift races, uh, you can choose avian if you don't want Aarakocra. But you're going to, you know, culturally, you, maybe you're just a different type of Aarakocra or we'll treat it like a sub race or something. There might be some physical differences or maybe maybe the Aarakocra, we will reflavor the Aarakocra to be um, water birds of some kind. Or maybe the Aarakocra are actually... Um, uh, uh, like vegetative birds, uh, you know, or whatever they're, they're, uh, well, if they came down and they drove off the merfolk, they're vegetarians, uh, or they're, they're pescatarians and maybe bugs. So that they eat vegetables, they eat fish and they eat bugs. And maybe we treat the imps and stuff. Uh, maybe we treat the, uh, varietal, uh, the varietal fiends as kind of like bugs, big bugs. However, if you play an avian, that is sort of like the cousin, and we say that those are the meat eaters. 
And so they are the ones that are going and uh, they're harvesting or they're ranching hootenannies. Um, or they're going out and uh, and they really love hunting down celestials because celestials are like the apex predators of the woods. And so they're like they have good muscle and they have some like good fat on them, right? We're, we've just built a whole ecosystem that includes the player races. We've described the origins of the player races. We've established that there's undead and even... Uh, we have a general idea of not just that there are undead, but why there's undead or how. And if we want to get into the geology, you know, we talked about this could have been an old floodplain or a shallow sea at some point in time that just kind of silted up over the eons. And now it's just kind of constricted down to a river that flows from distant mountains. And life followed with it. We have a geological history. We have ecosystems that make sense. We have predators and prey. Maybe there's special grasses that make special potions or interact differently or just are their own thing as a, as a foundation or a building block. You know, there's nothing saying you can't have a quipper that live, uh, you know, quipper for the, mo the monster stat block. But you go over here, you know, and we say that, um, uh, and we say, what if a common predator type undead you know, because this, it flows mostly through the grasslands. What if we say that there's actually undead fish, like skeletal fish, or, um, I don't know, uh, if this was an old floodplain, you know, some fossils might have been uncovered and are coming to life. The undead don't have to just be humanoids, by the way. The undead could be dinosaurs. The undead could be, um you know, primitive ancestors to the Aarakocra and the Merfolk. And because of magical shenanigans, now we're getting, you know, now we're getting skeletons that flop and swim, maybe even try and fly in some gross, you know, parody of life. What if the common predator type of undead is uh, kind of like a fungus drudge? It's like a plant undead. What if it's an undead that shares a, a, a two types? Or we just describe um, an algae moving through that can, you know, latch on to dead material. What if we had, uh, I don't know, a coal elemental rise up, a coal elemental rise up out of the, uh, out of the lands. I don't know, maybe they started mining for coal for some reason. And now what is coal but dead biomass? So we describe something that looks like an earth elemental, but it's actually a bunch of dead compressed plants and animals. And so our elemental, it might maybe a construct like a flesh golem, or we just simply describe coal as an undead thing. Oozes as undead, as petroleum. We have a petroleum jelly. <laughs> we have a petroleum jelly that's an undead ooze. Maybe And maybe we don't even count it as an ooze. Maybe we just say it's completely undead. It just has appearances of an ooze. What if there's some petrified trees that are rising to the surface through erosion or mining or water wear and tear? Oh, that's erosion. Or, again, magic just manifests in the things that have died here or the things that are living here and going to die. All of a sudden, they come back and they're causing problems. Hey, Grogren, a tar elemental, wouldn't that be something? An undead tar, uh, like a, uh, a, a a giant undead tar, right? Because it's all dead biomass. It's all carbon and carbohydrates and all this that's shambling around through, you know, this, this magic. What if the coal and the tar want to spread over the land? Wouldn't that be something? What if the coal and the tar has come back and is harvesting people for fuel? <laughs> take, take an ecological concept and flip it over. People have been going missing. And it, it you know, then we go on to find that this, uh, this undead, this kind of uh, sentience of magic 
is imbuing the dead to go and harvest others and to be made into undead. Maybe you're turned into charcoal. Maybe you're compressed down into biomass. And so all the undead are just tar, tar creatures, uh, put like petroleum creatures, coal, um, or even, uh, y you might even describe a uh, shale, you know, certain sedimentary rocks, limestone, limestone. You could imagine a world where you as a dungeon master tell your players, yeah, you can animate limestone with necromancy. Yellow, 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 yellow. How about them apples? <laughs> Popo potatoes, an entire society made of tar elementals. What in tar nation? Gogrin saying limestone, uh, meaning quick lime slimes. Plant based donkeys, a new meaning to your ass is grass. <laughs> Grogren says, here's me typing up a crystal punk inspired premise slowly bit by bit. Also, hi, James. Uh, I, I see your your good uh, your good RPG emote combo. Sound of feasting horn. And Grogren, thank you very much for the follow and for participating in the pool of ideas here. And yeah, Thantos, and this is one teeny tiny spot in the whole world. Sorry, I missed a lot in chat. I was on a soapbox, everyone. Oh, Exhausted Dragon was heading to bed. Have a good night, Exhausted. Thanks for helping if you're still around. James says, my players abandoned the story arc and campaign after losing to a dragon. Oh, did that just happen today? Like, is this, is it something, James, where maybe they felt like, oh, we got murked by a dragon? Like, you think that they, they'll cool off and say, well, where do we go from here? Or as a DM, can you say, I get it. We had a TPK, whether it was deserved or not. Because didn't you say that they were just jumping in, like, kind of willy-nilly? Like, they're like, yeah, let's go kill a dragon. And then they're like, well, we got killed by a dragon. That sucks. But look at all the prompts that we can have to think about ecology and geology. All the prompts that we can use to think about. Oh, it wasn't going to attack them until they attacked it. And what was their purpose for attacking it then, James? I mean, I imagine, I imagine you described, like, there's a dragon, you know, big and menacing. This thing could probably eat you alive. Or or however the introduction was. What prompted them to attack the dragon? But do you see, by going through things step by step, now we can fill in the outline. We have uh, tear ducks. We have hootenannies. Uh, we can go through and we can develop the notorious fey creature that lives in the forest. Uh, we can uh, we can uh, go through and there's a notorious fiend. And so while they're the common prey type, maybe there's actually like one's like apex predator fiend. There is actually the pit fiend or the Balrog or the whatever um, the the um, Garistro. You know, there's a like a named fiend that walks the grasslands that you want to stay out of the way of. Maybe that's what lives in the monster lair. And look now, we've considered rangers in, in all their options. We've considered druids. We have natural history, cultural and religious history. We have, you know, we've been thinking about the geology. How's the water flowing? What lies beyond the map? Hey, I Tyrant, welcome. Dark Wolf says, last time my party encountered a dragon, they put on a show for it to pay for crossing its territory. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, uh, the, the Handmaidens of Lolth, uh, are, which are uh, Yochlols. 
simply turn them from mustard elementals into tar elementals and call them undead instead of fiends if you want. Oh, I hope your player gets better, I Tyrant, but still, thank you for coming over. And yeah, Excel, if you don't want if you don't want your water to flow downhill, you don't have to. It's a fantasy world. In a sense, we in, uh you know, this ancient culture invented uh water traveling uphill by inventing this series of locks in this canal. And and look at all the look at all we played off of puns. I asked Dark Wolf for a random article of clothing to give to our water feature and she said pants. And so we made pants. Pants turned into, you know, because we use this for like deep water. Uh, pants and the bridges for this city that spans the, the canals. I said, yeah, this kind of looks like Psylocke. All of a sudden, these went from bridges to a system of locks. And every and each of the three bridges that were originally there are abbreviated PSY. So now we have the Psylocke's. You know, and there's the actual belt and not one of the varietal belts on her legs. You know, we went into the history here. Here's the new part of the city. This is the outlying area. It's also being under attack. There's the anti-magic area. There's the old place that was first founded, Old Town, which also seems to be in the, the first direction and an optimal place for avians in the forest to land. And then, of course, we have little Vedeli from all the Videlkin that came down through the locks because they're refugees. And then we came up with, you know what? The kind of bad part of town, it gets a little, it gets a little uh, damp. Uh, we call it the crotch, you know, because it's it's wedged right here between the two canals. And so that's kind of the, you know, the low lying district of town. Maybe not the best part of town. So we have puns, we have thoughtfulness, we have uh, ecology, we have a lot of things going on, and all of this was simply built step by step and with a great number of random dice rolls that we're just challenging ourselves to think about. We invented monsters, hootenannies, and uh, tear du uh, tear ducks. Okay, James, uh, thank you for stopping by and sharing. Uh, it basically said dinner time already, and they thought it meant them, and it didn't. As they left, a bunch of kobolds were bringing it a parade of food. But they skipped investigating. Oh, gotcha. On Critical Role, they thought they might be able to deal with the dragon, and it was a super ancient dragon that basically kills adventurers like nothing. James says, Aberration, stuff from the Underdark, tends to overlap with the Earth Plane, tends to work with weird magic effects. Excel says, You can also have a pocket of fresh water and a saltwater body and a body of salt and fresh. That reminds me of that underwater, above water, water town in River Kingdoms of Galerion. Yeah, and Excel, thank you for bringing that up because, you know, we're talking general conventions of what we know how things operate. If we want this to end up being salt water and so the middle of this river turns brackish, what works best for our story? What works best for you as the dungeon master that's going to present this? If salt water is coming down the canals, what does that mean? What does it mean? And wouldn't that be interesting? Because if we have a series of, uh, instead of freshwater canals, we go to saltwater canals, maybe that would dis uh, that would change how we alter the dungeon that is set there. And we describe, you know, kind of uh, amphibious sort of uh, sea anemones and, and the other life is more oceanic. And that could, uh, that could be a, a mix of things as well. Very good thoughts. You, you can always think outside the box. Hello, Daily. And of course, our, our Morlocks that live in the tunnels are Cordals. Oh, I got you, James. Okay. So, ta-da! Now, uh, this is this will uh, this will end the workshop. I'm gonna get up and take a quick break because I've had some soda and I need to go. Um, uh, contribute to ecology and uh, yeah, the Meyer lurks from Fallout 
I will be back in a couple minutes, and when we come back, if we want to talk about more ideas, uh, you know, monsters and puns and whatnot for here, if you want to share stories or table talk, uh, and of course, we can also wind down uh, by popping some capsules or boxes too. However, I'm doing the I Got a Wiggle Dance in my seat, so I will be back in just a couple minutes, everyone. <laughs> 